And this is really my primary point of the presentation today. As performers, when we notice something that doesn't seem or feel quite right, seek help, first from a trusted pedagogue, but that the problem persists, consider seeking advice from medical professionals. I really think I started noticing dystonic symptoms when I was an undergraduate student, and certainly when I was a graduate student in my 20s, although I didn't know what it was. I always assumed that I wasn't practicing long enough, hard enough, or even correctly. Eventually, I discovered a way to compensate, which kind of worked for much of my professional life, but it was always iffy, and there was always a question in my mind, will it work today? In 2008, my plane quickly devolved, and by September, I couldn't actually make a sound on the saxophone without biting myself in a very violent way. For the next four years, I tried to make it work on my own, but eventually gave up. I sought advice from my primary care physician, who as it turns out, happens to play trumpet and could understand what I was talking about. When I showed him, I actually played the saxophone, he looked at me and said, that's clonus. We all know what that piece means. It's actually clonus with a U at the end, but it's really a dystonic movement. He led me to a neurologist who led me to yet another neurologist, Dr. Yosef Yankovic at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston who prescribed Botox injections. He was going to put a needle here and inject me with Botox, which is a poison, botulinum toxin. Um, but if you go to get a facelift, that's what they put in your forehead to make the wrinkles go away, Botox. Many consider this to be a method of maintaining dystonia, but it's not a cure. Botox weakens muscles, but when we play the saxophone, we need to have some sort of muscle tone in our body just to make a sound. Later, I received clinical help from Chong Bai, an acupuncture doctor specializing in both Eastern and Western styles of medicine, which helped tremendously. In fact, I was shocked when I went to see him because the Western doctors really didn't know so much what dystonia was. But when I went into this fellow's office, he looked at me, kind of poked here, poked here, and said, yes, you have dystonia. This side of my face did all the work. It did all the compensating. And this side of my face atrophied. So the muscle tone over here became very weak, and the muscle tone here compensated and became very strong, which led to the dystonic shapes that you saw in the earlier video. Two more slides of me without a shirt. If it bothers you, avert. Here you can see a selfie of me getting an acupuncture treatment. He stuck needles here, 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 and here. And I did that in I'd say 2012, in December of 2012, and after five sessions, I began to practice normally again. I use the air quotes because there's not so much normal about it, but I could practice, and by the summer of that year, I was, I stood up and played in front of people, which was the first time in six years, perhaps. Been out five years. Here's another, maybe a clearer example of the, the acupuncture needles. I also sought advice from a chiropractor in Fort Worth, Keith Adak, who is a musician's specialist. And then I also went to Toronto and studied movement therapy and ergonomics with Joaquin Farias, a, a Spanish doctor who lives in Toronto specializing in dystonia of all types, not just for musicians. Finally, I met Dr. Saeed Survey at the UNT, University of North Texas Health and Science Center in Fort Worth, who happens to also be a musician and a trumpet player. 
Along this arduous journey, I received much valuable and important information from each of these professionals. In working with Dr. Survey, he suggested two courses of action. First, releasing the muscular tension in the culprit muscles, a treatment which he applies during a clinical visit. And second, incorporate the idea of cross-training. In this next video, you can see Dr. Survey apply two myofacial treatments to me. The video is about a minute. And I'll also speak as he does it. So this first treatment, he's taking his finger, he's sticking it up here, but inside, and pulling. And this is also a technique for people who have TMJ, temporomandibular jaw disorder, and it releases the tension. It's actually quite painful. You can't tell from the video, but I'm tearing because it hurts. Sometimes he pulls on my ear to help release the pressure. So the second treatment, he's asking me to stick my tongue to the roof of my mouth, like this, and he takes his finger and pushes down on the base of the muscles inside the oral cavity, simultaneously pushing up this way, so it looks kind of like what he's doing, like this. I can never really replicate it because the pressure he used is, is strong, and I just can't do it because, well, it hurts too much. But it also releases the tension. It's a bit like getting a massage. And he's, the masseuse is working on a muscle in your back and releasing that knot. And that's what's happening here. So a test that he has me do to determine whether or not I'm basically tight is to stick my tongue straight out like this. I move my tongue to this side, like this, and then move my tongue to that side. But my tongue doesn't move. What's happening is the stylohyoid muscle, which is right here, tethers the tongue to this side so that it loses flexibility. We all play saxophone, right? So you know, simply articulating notes, you need to have complete control of your tongue. Playing in tune, you need to have control of your tongue. Playing a high note, you need to have control of your tongue. All these things kind of went away. In fact, my tongue would do kind of the opposite thing that I would tell it to. Instead of, I'll describe it as arching higher in the oral cavity, it goes, <gasps> have you been to the doctor and he sticks one of those tongue suppressors in your mouth? That's what it feels like. To me. So, let's have a look at my face again without the outer layer. Don't worry, I put it back on for this speech. So, you can see under here that muscle, and even one more underneath, you can see the one that's, well, you might not be able to see, there's a black bar right under here pointing to the style of iron. So, he works on that muscle and then also the lateral pterygoid muscle, which is on the inside, right here. So, as a way of cross-training, Dr. Survey suggested that I practice the flute in addition to my daily practice of the saxophone. The skills necessary to create a tone, articulate the sound, and be expressive while performing the flute are similar to the saxophone, not exactly the same. In this way, by practicing the flute, my performance of the saxophone is indirectly improved. One of Dr. Survey's associates at the UNT Health Science Center, Dr. Ye Yang Lee, describes it as a way of confusing the brain.
But more specifically, when one learns a task, like if you go to play a piano and you learn a C major scale on the piano, the next day it gets a little better, the next day it gets a little better. The reason that happens is because your brain creates a fatty white substance called myelin and it sheaths, it creates a sheath around the axons of the nerves, allowing you to do that task more efficiently and quicker than the last time. It's thought that with people with dystonia, there's too much of that fighty, fatty white substance around the nerve endings so that the motion happens almost immediately, even before, if I put my mouthpiece to my mouth, sometimes my face starts shaking because of that condition. So the idea is, the brain creates only a finite amount of myelin by practicing another task that's very similar to that of the saxophone, i.e. in this case, the flute. That fatty white substance goes to other nerve endings, making those channels freer to function. So, here's an example of me playing the flute. not too bad. I can play with vibrato fairly easily, which I can't do with the saxophone, because it's a different, you know, it's a different kind of vibrato. I could make very large leaps, which sometimes I have difficulty to do with the saxophone. Yet, it also affects my flute playing. So I took that video about a year ago, but then a couple days later than that video, This is an example of dystonia. So that's a dystonic tremor that sometimes happens when I play the saxophone. Before dystonia ruled my life, I performed solo recitals in North America, Eastern and Western Europe, Africa, and Asia. I even performed a recital in Carnegie Hall. All the while, I noticed strangeness in my playing and difficulty doing specific performance techniques. For a variety of reasons, I waited much too long before seeking professional help. As dystonia began to dominate my musical life, I found myself practicing more and more, up to six hours a day, but it got worse and worse. My performance skills quickly devolved over the span of a year, which was two, uh, 10 years ago, 2008. And then for the next four years, I tried to figure it out with very little success. So currently, you, you heard my short little excerpt of Muczynski here. I also performed a piece with Mark Ford the other day, and that's par for course about what I can do. I've lost the ability to tongue really fast. I lost high tones, usually. Vibrato is nearly impossible, and intonation is weird. The word weird is ambiguous. What I mean specifically is notes that should be sharp come out flat. And if you think about it, well, that's kind of obvious because I can't always maintain an embouchure. If we think about basic saxophone pedagogy, more or less, when you play an alto saxophone mouthpiece, one gets about an A on the mouthpiece. You can split fine hairs, but I'm talking about a big adjustment. At the height of my dystonic, I could play only a D on the mouthpiece, a perfect fifth below. And probably right now, I might be able to play a G. So that's the default. So I'm aiming too low, but it's not that I'm aiming too low, it's just that the muscles are doing the opposite of what my brain is telling my muscles to do. Some demographics, generally, 
dystonia hits males in their 40s, which is when it hit me. So now I'm in my 50s, and I've lived with it for over a decade, and it, it's, it's better, I understand it a little bit more. Females, if a female will get it, it'll probably be earlier in their career, but men get it more than females. Classical musicians, by far, get it much more than non-classical musicians. And I think the idea behind that is we strive to make it perfect every time. And in so doing, I think we just go over and the same passage over and over until it's absolutely perfect. So that when you're under the gun to play it in front of people, it will be perfect. That's my thought. So another demographic. In general population, one in a million get it. In the world of music, one in 100 people get it. So at the UNT College of Music in Denton, we have 1,700 students and 100 faculty. I could come up very easily with six people who have dystonia. Not, not Amish dystonia. Uh, sometimes it's in the hands. Well, more often than not, it's in the hands. But I do know people who have it, brass players especially, here. Trombone players seem to get dystonia fairly often. Um, just recently, in fact, last week, I found out about uh, this oboe player. His name's Alex Klein. Does that mean anything to you? Alex Klein is, slash was, the principal oboe in the Chicago Symphony. Curious, he and I are the exact same age within some months. Also curious, dystonia hit him in his hand about the same time it hit me, which I thought was very curious. He's got another path to take because, you know, I have a tenured position, so I'm, I have some security. Yet, sometimes it works, which is why I started with, I wanted to perform for you to show you that today it seems to be working. Here's an example. I, I would tell you that most often, tonguing is nearly impossible. This particular day, which was maybe about a month ago, I could do this. That's not too bad. If I did that for you right now, it would be disastrous. I, I could hardly single tongue at a 92. So, my point to you, as teachers of young musicians and instrumentalists, be on the lookout for strange conditions that normal pedagogical advice doesn't fix, like excessive, unwanted, and uncontrolled movements in either the face or the hands, when what would be considered Normal practicing doesn't help. Consider seeking help from a medical professional and avoid waiting. Do it as soon as possible. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you very much for attending. I'm very appreciative of your time.